Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership. You can go to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Dan Worth. Dan is a partner and principal at BVH Architecture. He has over 38 years of experience in historic preservation, building rehabilitation, and facilities master planning. Since 1980, one of Dan's specialties has been focusing on historic preservation and rehabilitation through the Historic Building Survey, historic preservation planning, and numerous certified rehabilitation restoration projects, and in research and writing. Dan's recent experience includes over 150 projects for the Midwest region of the National Park Service for work on historic sites in a 13-state region, as well as clients including the state of Nebraska, the Nebraska State College System, the University of Nebraska, and the Smithsonian Institute. Dan was a member for the 12-year phased exterior restoration of the Nebraska State Capitol and the restoration planning at the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri. He recently directed the restoration of the Storm Museum of the Prairie Pioneer and the project that he's going to talk about today, the Douglas County Courthouse Hall of Justice Mural Restoration Project. Dan is active in local, state, and national historic preservation organizations and is a member of the College of Fellows of the Association of, for Preservation Technology International and the past chair of the Nebraska State Historical Preservation Board. Dan's talk today is titled, The Douglas County Courthouse Hall of Justice Mur Mural Restoration. Please join me in welcoming Dan Worth. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, Happy New Year. It's, it's great to be back at uh, Pal Brown Bag Lecture Series. I was talking with Gary um, before the, as we were setting up today, and I, I think this might be the 24th year that Pal has been uh, conducting the, the Brown Bag Series. So it's a, it's a great resource and it's a great, uh, great event. Uh, I look forward to it every month, and it's always a pleasure to, to talk with you. Um, the, the project I'm going to talk about today is, is one that's been ongoing since about 2009 um, over a phased uh, period of restoration. Um, even though it's in Omaha, it's got all these like good preservation stories. It, it has all these interesting threads that, that link together not only uh, Lincoln and Omaha, but, but our entire state. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, give you a little bit of background about the project, uh, talk about the process that we went through. Uh, we've got some great photographs of the after, uh, 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 after the preservation or uh, restoration was completed. And of course, uh, need to give a little bit of uh, credit to all of the, the team members that helped us along the way. So we're going to be, begin our journey uh, uh, with, with these gentlemen. Uh, the person sitting in the, in the middle of this photograph is John Latenzer Sr. Uh, John Latenzer was born in Liechtenstein in 1858, I believe, um, and studied at the uh, Polytechnic Institute in Stuttgart. He then uh, pursued an architectural career and, of course, ended up in Chicago, where all aspiring architects would go in, in the late uh, 19th century, because Chicago, of course, was kind of the the epicenter of, of emerging architectural practices. Uh, then he, he moved to, to uh, Omaha in 1887 and started his own practice. Um, and in 1915, he was joined by his sons, who you can see flanking him on, on both sides, uh, and formed John Latenzer and Sons, uh, which was a, one of the, uh, the powerhouses of, of architectural practice in the 20th century. The firm lasted for about 50 years uh, through, the, through the 1970s. They, uh, as you drive around not only Omaha but the, the state, you'll see many, many of their, of their, um, their uh, icons of, of classical design. Um, probably one of his most notable and, and most recognizable is the Omaha Central High School. 
which was uh, uh, constructed in 1900 and uh, later additions in 1912. Uh, of course, it's uh, situated on the, the site of our first two territorial capitals uh, from 1854 and 1858. Latenzer and Sons, uh, Latenzer and Latenzer and Sons did a wide range of projects, including many uh, notable uh, commercial uh, uh, projects as well. On the left, you'll see a Carpenter Paper building from 1906. The middle is the Omaha Athletic Club, 1917, and of course Brandeis Department Store. Many of us visited Brandeis when we were very young with our parents. Uh, it was a wonderful place to go, uh, constructed in 1906. Latenzer had his, had his imprint on, on our Lincoln uh, community as well, teaming with uh, Davis Wilson in 1922. To, uh, to build the first phases of Memorial Stadium. And of course, uh, located near us here, the Temple Building in 1906. As I mentioned, uh, Latenzer and the Latenzer and Sons did projects all across our state. Uh, this was a little courthouse in Broken Bow, Nebraska, uh, dating from 1911. And of course, what we're here to talk about today is the Douglas County Courthouse which was uh, constructed in 1909 to 1913. Of course, Latenzer uh, being uh, in Chicago and of course being in Omaha was certainly influenced by the Chicago World's Fair and the Trans-Mississippi Exposition, uh, the City Beautiful mu movement and the classical revival styles of architecture. Uh, the Douglas County Courthouse, of course, rendered in Indiana limestone like our own uh, Nebraska State Capitol. This is an article from the Omaha World Herald in 1912, uh, kind of announcing some of the final touches of the uh, Douglas County Courthouse, announcing the final murals that were being executed by an artist by the name of William Rao, R-A-U, uh, through his uh, employer, Phil, uh, Emil Philipson, who was a uh, decorating contractor from New York City. Uh, for the grand total of uh, $5,000, they executed uh, five murals uh, in the rotunda up underneath the dome of, of uh, the uh, Douglas County Courthouse. Uh, here's a image from uh, right after the, the courthouse opened from the Bostrick Frohart, Frohart collection at the Durham Museum. Uh, the, the collection of photographs from the Bostrick Frohart were invaluable as we uh, looked and did research on the restoration of the, of the, of the uh, murals. Here you can see, uh, kind of looking up in the corner and to the left, uh, a couple of the, uh, the beginnings of the, the thematic uh, presentation of the murals. They all represented the, the first peoples in the settlement and the evolution of the land of Nebraska and the Omaha area. On the left, you'll see uh, Indian encampment, followed by uh, a prairie scene, and then to the right is the uh, the, the 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 white men arriving uh, on the plains. And you'll see more of those in upcoming slides. After World War One, uh, of course, uh, students of history, you all know that that. Uh, uh, the country was uh, in kind of a tumultuous period uh, with the returning soldiers, uh, uh, labor uh, unrest, uh, race relations were uh, kind of stretched. Uh, Omaha was, was also not immune to any of those situations. Uh, in 1919, um, there was uh, numerous strikes that were going through the Omaha community, boiler makers, brick makers, uh, Teamsters were out on strike in July of 1919. Uh, then in September, in the fall of 1919, uh, the meat packers went out on strike. And if you know the history of Omaha labor, uh, the meat packers in the South Omaha meat packing industry were a giant amongst uh, the labor forces there. What really sparked um, uh, the, the eventual demise of, of, of part of the, the murals was the arrival of about 500 black uh, strike workers uh, that started to uh, uh, work as non-union laborers in the in the uh, meatpacking 
houses. And then on September 25th, uh, what uh, sparked a, a riot, which you see a photograph of here, um, a white woman was accosted and a black man was arrested for her for assault. A uh, crowd turned out, um, the, the riot uh, became uh, unregulated. Uh, they broke into the, into the Douglas County Courthouse, uh, drug out the mayor and the black man, hung them both. Uh, the mayor escaped, uh, thankfully, but the, bl the black man was killed. Uh, the, the, the rioters set the, the, cow the courthouse on fire and uh, caused uh, quite a bit of damage. Um, the, the, the main floor of the, the, the courthouse was pretty much gutted by fire. Uh, that fall, in, uh, the Nebraska legislature went into special session to appropriate or to approve uh, the Douglas County uh, Board to issue bonds for the eventual restoration of the, the, the courthouse, just a few years old, and also to replace the records that had been destroyed as part of the, the riot and fire. That kind of started a series of, of interventions on the murals that some were not too well executed. Um, um, uh, the first intervention occurred in 1922 by William Barrett of New York City. Uh, in 1932, there was another intervention uh, by some uh, German artists. And then as this article from the Omaha World Herald, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, notes of uh, the WPA was called in in 1938 to lend uh, their expertise in helping to clean uh, overpaint and, and uh, preserve and uh, uh, help uh, restore the, uh, the murals. The WPA also installed some uh, early lighting devices around the murals so visitors to the, the courthouse could uh, see them better. That uh, led to a, a period of, I guess, uh, inaction on the murals until about 1980 when the Douglas County uh, Commission uh, asked a couple of artists under the direction of uh, the Jocelyn Museum to under, undertake an, an intervention where they would stabilize, clean, and, and repair the murals. Uh, these guys took about four months, about $25,000, to, uh, to, restore to restore the murals. And it created quite a controversy. I moved to Omaha in 1980, and about the time that, uh, that these murals were done, there were all kinds of editorials that were coming out in the papers about how these guys, what did they do? There's you know, all kinds of figures that they added to the murals that were quite controversial. And you'll see some of that here in a, in a little bit. From 1980 until uh, mid-2000s, not much had been done to, uh, to uh, the murals and to the dome. Uh, deterioration continued to the murals. Uh, water continued to leak uh, through the skylight system, uh, causing a lot of plaster damage and further deterioration to the, to the murals. So in 2009, the, the Douglas County uh, uh, Building Commission uh, asked BVH to help uh, uh, come in and, and put, put, a, put a, 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 an end to the deterioration. The first project that we, that we undertook was uh, complete skylight replacement. <coughs> replacement. And this uh, little drawing uh, starts to illustrate the, the components of that project. It's a section through, through the skylight, the, the dome and the drum. Uh, the, the murals are placed in these niches. This, these uh, stained glass lay lights are here. And above that are the, uh, the, the skylights themselves. So the first project replaced the entire skylight system. This uh, photograph shows you the truss work and the, uh, the skylights uh, on top of it. That prevented water from, from leaking in and causing plaster damage and chunks of plaster falling six stories down to the rotunda floor. The next phase of work that was undertaken in, in 2010 was the actual stabilization and restoration of the, uh, the stained glass lay lights. Um, and again, that's this layer right underneath the, the skylights. 
the, the stained glass ley lights are composed of these triangular shaped 16 of, of them, uh, stained glass panels in wood frames. Um, all of those were carefully removed, taken to a stained glass uh, restoration shop in Omaha. Um, I think Mark Lambricht uh, did the restoration uh, in 2010, and then they were reinstalled. You can see more details of those uh, 16 stained glass panels. So from 2010 to uh, approximately you know, middle of uh, 2016, uh, Douglas County took a breath um, and then in the middle of 2016 they, they took the leap to do the third and final uh, uh, phase of restoration. Um, as, the, as the water had uh, subsided, the plaster was starting to dry out, more plaster was starting to fall uh, on the rotunda. So Paul Cohen, who's the uh, uh, Omaha Douglas uh, Public Building Commissioner, uh, contacted us and developed a uh, public-private partnership to, to take on the, the restoration of the, the, the eight murals. Uh, the murals, as we found them in 2016, uh, were in a variety of, of conditions, um, all resulting uh, from that initial fire in, in 1919. And then by those somewhat haphazard uh, repairs over uh, you know, the uh, 80 or 90 years. Um, this is uh, the initial mural number one, which is called Indian Encampment. Um, but a close-up examination, you can see that the water damage had caused uh, lots, of, lots of deterioration. The plaster behind the murals was exfoliating, the paint was peeling, uh, murals were uh, sagging and coming loose. And as you can see in this uh, upper right corner here, actually parts of the original canvas had been removed and paint was applied directly to plaster uh, during some of those previous uh, attempts at restoration. So in May of, of 2016, BVH uh, started uh, working on, on the mural restoration project. We developed a, a set of bid documents and specifications uh, for the restoration. We uh, sent those pro uh, bid documents out uh, for public bidding. Um, and in the fall of 2016, we, uh, we enlisted the aid of Evergreen Architectural Arts from Chicago and New York City to, to help with the, the restoration. So with uh, Evergreen Architectural Arts on, on the team, uh, the first bit of work that we uh, had to do was figure out how we were going to gain access and create a safe working uh, environment for for the restoration. So we developed a strategy. This is that same view looking up uh, at the sixth floor and what you're seeing is the underside of some trusses in a, in a uh, 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 what we called the dance floor, uh, a big work, work floor uh, where all the restoration was staged from. I think uh, those of you that came to a PAL lecture a few years ago, Bob Ripley showed the same exact kind of technique that was uh, done in the, uh, the legislative chambers at the Nebraska State Capitol where a work surface was placed over the, the chamber itself to get artisans up close to the, to the work. So in December of 2016, this is uh, at the end of the, the scaffolding or the dance floor installation. And you can see we, we placed that about six feet below the, the cornice line. So Artisans had easy access to the mural niches. They could reach the, the cornice, the decorative plaster cornice, as well as uh, have a rolling scaffold on the, on the dance floor to, to reach the, uh, the skylight system. There's a later view of the dance floor uh, as restoration was progressing in, in early 2017. Um, you can see here that a lot of the plaster repairs were completed at the cornice. Uh, painting and priming uh, was being completed at many of the niches and a couple of the, uh, the murals were left in place and restored in place and I'll cover some of that in, the, uh, in a couple of slides here in a second but you can see the value of, of having this kind of safe 
a secure workplace. It also kept junk from falling six stories down, you know, onto uh, visitors and, and uh, workers at the, uh, at the courthouse. It's part of one of the first steps of the restoration process, uh, having the, the, uh, the, the work deck there was to start to get up close to the surfaces and see uh, what we could find out about the history of the colors and materials that were used. Uh, and right in the middle of this slide, right here, you can start to see where we're doing some exposures and some uh, paint analysis. It's a little closer view uh, of an area where we started to strip away the various layers of paint um, and recording those. This was a little field sketch that we kept on the right hand side uh, showing the various layers of paint uh, that had occurred over time. You can, as you can see in the, the right hand side, uh, we did find some gold leafing on several of the, uh, the, the uh, plaster elements uh, on the bead and reels and, and some of the uh, other decorative elements. From that we started to do mock-ups, full-scale mock-ups of what those original color schemes looked like. So in the middle of, of here, uh, inside of this blue tape is really the, the final color scheme that we came up with based upon those, those historical um, investigations. It's interesting to look at this and then look at what was the, the 1980s color scheme. You can, for those of us who practiced in the 1980s, you can see the, the, the nice teal and the, the, the greens and, and mauves that were very popular in the 80s, but not very appropriate for uh, a classical uh, uh, edifice such as this. As I mentioned, we found uh, 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 lots of elements that contain gold leafing. So the decision was made to uh, be true to that and go back and, and apply the gold leafing in, the, in those areas. Here's one of the artisans from Evergreen doing that very delicate uh, uh, process of you know, sweeping gold leaf off of a tissue paper onto the surface and brushing it on. Uh, a very tedious and uh, careful process. But the results are, are very striking. Um, I mean, all of the, all of the, the gorgeous plaster uh, uh, relief that was part of the classical vocabulary, uh, you know, with the original color scheme, you can really uh, see that detail and, and it's very, very uh, fun to, to go back and see that now. As we started the restoration process, one of the first things that we did after we did the, uh, the, the initial investigations was to put that roller, uh, excuse me, rolling scaffold on the dance floor and get up and look at the, the skylights that were uh, installed back in 2010. They were indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, performing very well, but one of the things that we weren't able to do back in 2010 was get to the underside of the, the framework that held the, the, uh, the stained glass windows in place. So again, we did paint analysis on those supporting ribs and found that there were metallic paints that were used originally, so we matched those. And uh, as you can see on the, the right and in this slide, uh, we did restore those, those areas as well. Then once uh, the skylight work was, was completed, we were able to remove that, that rolling scaffolding and uh, reduce the load on that uh, dance floor so we could move uh, more workers onto that dance floor and start the, the restoration process. Another uh, piece of work that we did um, as we went around and examined all of the murals was to do uh, high definition digital photography uh, uh, using, oh, as you can see in the, uh, the lower right hand corner here, some uh, color rendition charts to accurately document what we found uh, in place, uh, and then to do close up examinations, condition assessments of, of the, uh, the murals. 
Remember that uh, Bostwick Frohart uh, photograph that I showed you uh, several slides ago, ago in the Omaha World Herald uh, articles? Well, we used those and, and uh, did some, some research and contrasted those to what was in place. And uh, the area that's uh, in this red box here, we started to do some exposure windows because we we had a suspicion that this Indian figure was not part of the original, uh, the mural. And yes, that's, that's what we found. As a matter of fact, we, we found in this little exposure window here, we found the, the rear end of a buffalo. Um, and then by uh, looking at the original uh, mural uh, photographs from Bostwick Frohart, we were able to reconstruct that mural scene. Uh, here's a maquette of of that, what that um, original mural looked like uh, from Evergreen Studios. So you can see that uh, it was changed quite radically over time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some artisan, I, we think it was in the 30s and then again in the 80s, uh, got on this kick of adding these heroic kinds of figures in the corner pan panels uh, for whatever reason, uh, kind of destroying the thematic uh, uh, interpretive uh, content of, of, the, uh, of the original mural uh, program. So after we did this with all of the murals, we made a decision amongst our team that, uh, and because of the deterioration of, of many of the murals, that five of the murals were going to be reproduced and uh, new murals put in place, and that we could save three of the original murals uh, and restore them in situ. Here's an artisan uh, uh, touching up the, the new mural of the, the prairie scene uh, after it was reinstalled. But here, it, this is uh, mural number four called Clearing of the Land. And you can see this very crudely painted um, figure, like Lady Liberty or a, a manifest destiny kind of, of thematic thing that was overlaid with Clearing of the Land. Um, and I think you can kind of see too, uh, this, this piece right here, that's plaster. It's just paint that's peeling off the plaster. So there's really no canvas underneath, but you can see here where the canvas is starting to let loose from the plaster. So because of the fire, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the uh, fire damaged and smoke damaged canvases had been removed and paint was applied directly to plaster. So through that research, uh, here's the maquette of the clearing of the land. The same goes for uh, uh, number six, mural number six, which is wheat fields. This was kind of the goddess of agriculture, I guess. Um, but the, the final uh, maquette for that is more of this kind of a scene, true uh, uh, you know, interpretation of early agriculture and the bounty of harvest. That, uh, that dance floor uh, proved to be an invaluable staging uh, area because as you can see, these, these canvases were quite large. Uh, the canvases were, as they were taken off, uh, carefully taken off of the, the niches, they were carefully traced, they were shipped to New York uh, where they were repainted. Um, and uh, in pieces, then they were shipped back to, to Omaha, laid out on the, the dance room floor. And then this series of slides shows how the artisans would then restore those uh, uh, canvases back into those niches, uh, trim them to, to fit, and then carefully touching those up. It's a very labor intensive process. And then the final one, this, this was the, the, the image uh, and was the result of a lot of edit editorials in the Omaha World Herald in 1980 uh, from, from that restoration period. It's the, the uh, mural number eight, which is the Missouri River Valley scene. But uh, for some reason or other, there's this uh, hovering angel. Uh, 
but this is what it was intended to look like. Uh, kind of the culmination of that whole uh, theme of, of uh, from the first peoples to the, the settlement and, and the uh, use of the land. This is a scene looking from, we assume from the Iowa side of the river looking back across the river to the, 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 the new city of Omaha, the Union Pacific Railroad Bridge that was built in 1881 showing you know, signs of development and progress moving forward as we're looking west into the sunset. And here's the installation of that, of that mural. The murals that were left in place and uh, restored in situ uh, uh, underwent a, a process, a very conservation-minded process, where uh, old varnishes that were applied and sealers were stripped. Uh, we did some investigations uh, to see what uh, the original formats looked like and what the original scenes were like, just enough that we could uh, understand what the original scene should be. Um, then through research and through photographic methods we did overlays uh, of how we were going to adapt and update those murals to more closely match uh, the original uh, murals. And then uh, I show this little palette uh, in that uh, all of the colors that were mixed back in New York in the artist studios Many of those were then packaged up and sent back to the field so the artisans touching up these murals could use the same color palette. So we came up with a consistent color palette around the entire mural network. And here's a detail, I just love looking at these details, con contrasting the, the unrestored mural or I'll say the, the modified mural after being modified and overpainted for about three or four times and how flat and dull and dark it had become to the, res uh, the same scene in the restored mural. Um, here, I'll show you a slide of the completed mural here shortly, but you can see the, the brightness was back, the bold, the paint strokes are, are more richer in the shadows and even some of the details in the content uh, were back and, and very rich. Part of good conservation practice, what we started to do for the Douglas County Public Building Commission is create an archive. Again, in the spirit of what we've seen here in Lincoln at the Nebraska State Capitol, all of the, the, the investigative pieces, the samples, the materials, all of the pieces that we removed, uh, we carefully cataloged, wrapped, and stored. And now uh, the, the Building Commission has a, a an archive that they can go to in the next, for the next generation of restoration that might occur in the building. So the, the project, as I said, started um, in December of 2016. We had substantial completion in the summer of 2017. And then after the scaffolding came down, we, uh, we had our uh, final mural. So the, the next series of slides really just show you the, the completed murals as they exist now, kind of starting with uh, mural number one, uh, the Indian encampment. Mural number two, the prairie scene with a herd of buffaloes. No, uh, no figure in the foreground, but, but more interpretive of the, the Great Plains environment as the arrival of the white man comes and the experience of, of immigration and traveling across uh, the Platte Valley and through our trail networks. A clearing of the bluffs, the land overlooking Omaha. The plowing of the land. And then to the planning of uh, agriculture and the, and the the harvesting of, of, of the crops. And then finally, uh, the, number eight, the, uh, the Missouri River scene, looking across, seeing uh, the new uh, emerging city of Omaha, Nebraska. Now as you look up uh, from the, the ground floor up through the rotunda, 
you can see the murals uh, nicely illuminated. We took advantage while we had the, the dance platform up there to install new LED lighting underneath uh, the murals to illuminate those. Uh, that, uh, of course, is uh, very delicate lighting. It helps uh, not only illuminate them, but doesn't have the damaging UV characteristics that other lighting sources have. Here, this is a view looking south. You can see the Indian encampment, and then the thematic uh, series uh, goes to your right and ends up with the Missouri River Valley on the left. Another view from the fourth floor. And the final slide. It's interesting to note uh, the restoration campaign that we undertook stopped right about at this line. And so you can see the 1980s kind of uh, color scheme still remains down below that line. But um, I think we've gotten the uh, Public Building Commission very excited about continuing that effort down through the rotunda, down through the main floor, and all of those public spaces. As you know, uh, these public buildings, and because of the nature of courts, they, they do undergo a lot of uh, rehabilitation, a lot of different uh, alterations, but I think they're very proud now of, of what's at the top of this rotunda and are anxious to, to see that campaign continue. Uh, there were some exposure windows uh, made on these, uh, these walls. We did find some stenciling, which we confirmed on those historic photographs, so I think they're anxious to uh, start that campaign as soon as they can afford it. So no, no project is done by one person. Uh, we had a great project team. Uh, the, you can see the uh, Public Building Commission uh, on the left. Uh, those members fully embraced the project and, and Paul Cohen and, and Lori Headland were the key day-to-day uh, -day, uh, client contacts and uh, were wonderful to work with. Um, the BVH team, including Steve Kelly, Gary Bowen, and Kelly Rosberg, and then the Evergreen Architectural Arts team, quite a list of, of artisans. Uh, took a lot of hands to do all those paintings and, and installation of the canvases. The two people that really uh, led the, the charge were Terry Vander. Vanderwell and uh, Kumiko, Kumi as we called her. She was the lead conservation uh, person on site. And then as I mentioned uh, at the outset, this was a public-private partnership. Um, I think, yes, you probably recognize this name, Ronald Roskins. He used to be the president of the university system. He's now on the Public Building Commission board and and he picked up the phone and, and called several of his friends in Omaha and raised a considerable amount of money to help uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the private side of this, this effort. And those uh, folks uh, and institutions are listed on the left. Uh, and we thank them for their generous contributions to restoring this, this wonderful spot in Omaha. So the next time you're in Omaha, you'll have to stop by the, the courthouse and, uh, and take a peek. Uh, it's, it's quite a wonderful, wonderful place. It was once kind of a dark, dingy hole that no one really knew uh, what was up there, but now you can walk in and, and experience this, this grandeur of this beautiful classical revival uh, place. So with that, I'll stop and uh, entertain any questions that you might have. Yes, Mike. General idea of the cost of the whole project? Yeah, uh, Mike asked a question about the, the cost of the entire project. The, the, the contract for restoration, including contingencies um, and some other uh, factors, was uh, about $470,000. That was for the mural project? For the mural project, yeah. What about the skylight and the, what about the skylight and the lay-in? Skylight and the, and the uh, uh, stained glass restoration. I don't have that number with me today, Mike, sorry. But um, 
Yeah, Matt. Can you go back in your slides about five or six images? I have a question on right there, that one. Okay. Um, there's kind of a, a balcony level here right below the murals. Is that an original element of the courthouse or was that added? Like it is an original. Uh, what is not original, Matt asked if that balcony level um, or mezzanine level was, was original. Um, we call this the sixth floor. This is actually the fifth floor. The sixth floor uh, served as um, an access point to the jail cells behind many of these areas, behind these big thick masonry walls were some of the original jail cells of the, of the courthouse. Um, those have since been taken out of, out of service. There's a new uh, Douglas County Jail kind of south and, and uh, west of downtown. Uh, these guardrails were, were added and um, as we were doing this project, um, there was some restoration going on, or excuse me, rehabilitation going on up at that level for some other juvenile courts and other offices. Yeah. Dan, there's a, one of the very first slides had a similar angle showing mm -hmm. showing that. Could, could you sure. find that one? Let me see here. Are you looking for that black and white? Yeah. There we go. Oops. Whoops. Sorry. There we go. Push the wrong button. There's the Indian encampment. That's mural number one, which is over the south elevator bank. What's really interesting here is uh, the, the historic elevators have that glass and brass kind of front. Those uh, have been replaced, uh, are no longer there but I assume they probably were destroyed during the fire, perhaps. Um, and you can also see some of the stenciling on those panels below. Eileen. Is this where you got, I mean, the, the original murals and what they were mm -hmm. designed originally for? Are some of these photographs is where you got that, or did you have other information that helped you with that? Uh, we we used uh, the Boswick Fro out heart uh, photos. Yes, so uh, we enlarged these. Uh, the the artisans of Evergreen Studios used those, blew those up, and based upon the tracings of what was in place and comparative kind of analysis with with the photographic evidence, that's how they arrived at how to reconstruct those murals. We also had some some really grainy images from. Uh, Omaha World Herald archives uh, from, you know, in the 1912 papers. They were microfilmed, of course, and those microfilm images are a little grainy sometimes. But some of those, some of those microfilmed images, though, confirm that those figures that were overpainted were not there originally. So the original photographs from the Boston Pro Art Collection were in black and white, obviously. Yes. So from that, your artisans could determine the shape of what had been there originally and the content, but the analysis of the surface, and you had to dig down several layers to figure out what colors. Correct. Colors. Right. The question was about using the photographs to get the, the shape and, and overall composition, but the coloration, we used the, the, the exposure windows, the analysis to do that. So yes, that was correct. Yeah. During the 80s, I think you said they added these figures and that why? Good question. <laughs> Good question. I, I don't know. Someone was compelled to, you know, do their artistic addition. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for artists to kind of hold back sometimes, I guess, but we all need to leave, our, leave a mark. Yeah, right, because they could. And we're not quite sure whether that was... Where, whether that was done in the 80s. I think some of those were repainted in the 80s. There's some, some um, thought that maybe in the 1938 WPA uh, intervention added some of those figures as well. 
It yes. seems like the project moved very fast. Yeah. It did go very fast. It did go very fast. Um, uh, it was a very efficient project. Once, once you get scaffolding up, you know, as we know from experience at, at the Nebraska State Capitol, scaffolding is very expensive uh, to rent it every month. So once that went up, we just like kept the pedal to the metal and kept going. But we had done enough planning uh, up to that point that we knew when the scaffolding was, was put in place what we had to do to, to make those decisions and keep that process going very quickly. Mike? Well, just a comment, I think there's so much attention, the 1919 riot and lynchings, um, it's always a focus is, uh, is on that part of the story. And um, uh, I guess we, I have never seen anything that shows quite as well as this program does the extent of the fire damage, property destruction that this mob did at the same time. It's usually uh, sub yeah. subsidiary to the, to the uh, murder. Yeah. So it's interesting from that point of view, just in itself. Yeah, yeah. So that, much. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to go in and, and I, that's another entire project just to, to see what, what is left from the original construction and what, uh, what was replaced after the 1919 riot. At some point, a HSR, a Historic Structures Report, would be a really valuable thing to do for this building. Yeah. Jim? Were the original plans available? Building plans? Um, no. Not that I can recall. Um, there was a question about were the original building plans available. Um, no. Um, we don't have any documentation um, about the murals. So they were done by a decorating contractor out of New York. Um, and even this um, art artisan or the artist of the original murals, uh, William Rao, um, very little is known about him. but. <clears throat> excuse me, through the conversations with Evergreen, uh, their New York studio, or their Brooklyn studio, one of the uh, lead painters on this had worked on some Rao paintings uh, oh, maybe a decade ago and was familiar with his work. He was, I think he came from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Academy of Art. And so stylistically, I don't know that much about the Philadelphia Academy and, and what came out of that, but um, he said that these were very characteristic of, of the Philadelphia school. Um, so, yes? Are there any comparisons then, Dan, relative to these murals and, and their feel and, and thematic existence with our uh, post offices around the state and the murals that we have uh, that were done probably at a similar time? Um, no, we haven't done that. Has most office bills were done in the late 1980s, 1930s. 30s, yeah. the WPA. WPA. Yeah. And, and yeah. like the post office murals, the documentation book that uh, Bob Buschendorf and the Historical Society put together, is there something that's documented this then? That you? Yeah, I'm, not that I'm aware of, um, but. But there will be. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an uh, yeah, another project. So yeah. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. What was the response of the Omaha community? Did the people appreciate the work that was done? Yeah, I think it's just becoming, uh, uh, Roxanne asked about the appreciation of the Omaha community uh, for the project. And yes, I think uh, everybody that's been involved and, and seen the project is, is very uh, struck by it uh, in a positive way. Um, I think the word's just starting to leak out, too. Um, there was an article about as the scaffolding came down and the murals were re, uh, revealed, I think in the World Herald back at last fall, there was some article about it. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, with uh, putting together this little PowerPoint and a few other things, we'll uh, get the word out so people will go see it. Eileen? Can you tell us more about the floor, how you made that floor? I didn't see much of scaffolding, but now when you talk about yeah. So did the scaffolding go up from a lower level? Yeah, the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, this slide you can see the trusses that span from side to side and then um, all of the, the structural lumber that was on top and then the plywood on top of it. 
So uh, there was scaffolding that went around, vertical scaffolding that went around the perimeter, you know, traditional uh, scaffolding that those trusses were set on, and then we built the floor on top of, of that. So you can see the plywood uh, subfloor, all the joints are taped so no dust or matter could, could fall down. We even put plastic around or, you know, um, tarps around the edges so no, no debris or anything could accidentally get kicked or, or fall off the scaffolding and tumble down six stories. So it was, it was uh, quite, quite a feat, Roxanne. Did all that scaffold cost? <laughs> that was part of that $473,000. <laughs> so it wasn't a huge amount. I mean, no. for the large graders keep up the world, it wasn't a huge amount. No. Because labor would probably be most expensive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Roxanne asked the question about how much the scaffolding cost for you viewers at home. Um, and, and I answered, I don't know, but I can find out if you're very curious about it. <laughs> I'll have to look at the contractor's uh, pay app and I can, I can find that out. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. Well, thank you for, for coming and uh, appreciate your, your attention.